not interested in Debian or Debian related matters, this may be the wrong room. Um, but please feel free to become educated. Uh, it is the better, the best distro after all. Uh, yeah, or you could have a lightning talk about what is the best distro. <laughs> Bless you, Paul. <laughs> So currently we have a, um, this is what the schedule looks like for today. Um, we've got cold talks and up, we've got talks until afternoon tea. There is a slot which is currently empty because I miscalculated. Um, oops. Uh, and we're looking at doing lightning talks in the afternoon. That might get brought forward straight after afternoon tea if no one jumps up and down and says, I would actually like to talk about something or two people want to talk about something. Um, so yeah, please let me know if you've got a, a burning desire that you want to, to give a serious talk about something uh, that you can do impromptu or have prepared slides. Um, yeah, that'll be awesome. So to start off with, um, I'd like to welcome up uh, Francois Mario to talk about supporting Debian machines for friends and family. Uh, he's been a, how long have you been a Debian developer for? Um, 10 years. Ten, 10 years as a, as a DD. Uh, certainly helped me become more involved with Debian. Uh, he has mentored a lot of people over the years about how to get involved with Debian, how to package uh, your favourite app, and all sorts of areas like that. Um, so, thank you, Francois. Let's jump over to you. Thank you. All right, well, I shouldn't be unmuted. All right, so what I want to talk about today is basically how do you make free software enjoyable for friends and family, right? If you have ever installed Debian or Ubuntu or whatever um, for friends and family, um, you may want to make sure that they have a good experience, right? So that they can enjoy the benefits of free software. Um, but the thing is, you're probably not, if you're doing that for your friends and family, you probably don't want to end up being a full-time sysadmin for them, right? You, want, you don't want to spend all of your free time doing that support. So how do you strike that balance? That's what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about a few things. Um, some comments about hard hardware, um, package updates, because that's important to do once in a while, uh, monitoring, safety, security, remote access, and also backups. So throughout my talk, I'm going to be, I'm going to be referring to one specific, one specific example of, uh, of a person uh, whose computers I maintain. And um, my clicker doesn't work anymore. There we go. So my dad. Um, my dad lives in Canada. And uh, for those who don't know, that's over there. Um, but the important part is that the link, or the shortest path between uh, New Zealand and Canada, is actually quite long. So there's quite a bit of latency there, and that is going to come, uh, is, is going to be important later on. Um, his computers are named after Icelandic cities, so uh, he's Keplavik, which is basically a computer that sits on top of the cabinet there. It does Myth TV, it does, um, there's also, well, this clicker is really bad. Um, it also does uh, asterisk, so there's a vo voice over IP phone, and uh, the, the, so Keplavik has an asterisk server on it. Uh, another computer is called Accurity, and um, it's basically a normal sort of desktop computer, uh, which happens to be running Ubuntu. Um, in terms of hardware, I want to make a couple of comments. The first one is that whenever I support someone's machine, um, I make a few uh, su suggestions or actually requirements. And the first one is I'm not going to support your machine if it doesn't have double the number of hard drives that it needs. So I want to set it up as RAID 1. Um, oh, I want, if you, so if you want one 300 gig hard drive, you're going you're gonna to have to buy two. Because I set them up with RAID 1 so that they're married. And if one of them dies, it uh, doesn't matter. I can, you can swap it, and I can SSH into your box and resync the drives. Now, it turns out that that has been incredibly useful for my dad's computer. I've had to replace a very large number of Seagate hard drives. Um, little hint here, don't buy Seagate. <laughs> but, uh, but if you do buy Seagate or end up with some crappy Seagate drives in there, make sure they're married. Um, that has saved a lot of time because you don't want to spend all your time reinstalling the box from scratch. 
when a hard drive dies. So very, very useful. And it's not that expensive anyways. Um, the other thing I do, um, it's a little bit dirty, but uh, the, uh, that's behind the cupboard. Uh, that's why there's a little bit of a stuff there. Um, but that's a UPS. So that's another thing that's, that, that doesn't cost that much money, but it's really, really convenient because um, you don't have to deal with little power glitches and the server rebooting in the middle of you know, syncing the hard drives or whatever. Um, the cool thing is that you can put in, you can plug in the, uh, the router, the, mo the cable modem, and, uh, and the main computer, not the monitor. And then you can just SSH into it, and you can, see, you can see on your console, oh, the power's been cut. But you're still SSHing in there, and you can like, shut, down, shut things down properly. Um, so quite useful. I highly recommend it. It turns out that um, a lot of people have kind of bad power. Um, this, this, UPS, this UPS actually kicks in quite often for like five seconds. I'm not sure why, but you know, there's like, sometimes it has to do with the, the fridge or the washing machine kicking in. It's kind of weird. Um, but again, I think it's worth it um, to do this. Um, the other thing I do is um, when I set up a new computer, uh, right from the start, I'm going to run memtest86 on it. That checks whether or not the memory is any good, so the RAM. And if it's not, just like abort. Basically, like replace the RAM. If you don't have good RAM, like everything is going to blow up. Um, and there'll be like random errors, and it's, it's just not worth any of your time. So do that one, but before you set up um, a computer. Uh, the other thing is kind of useful for checking for, uh, the hard drives for bad blocks. Um, but the RAM is, is probably the most important there. In terms of package updates, there's a couple of uh, things that you can do. Um, I use two different packages. First one is Apticron. The other one is called Unattended Upgrades. So Unattended Upgrades does what it says on the tin. Basically, it runs app get update, app get upgrade, and upgrades everything automatically for you. Um, by default, it only does that for security updates, not for like stable updates. Um, Apticron is, uh, is a different one. Uh, what that one does is that it will not apply updates for you, but it will actually send you an email every time there's, up, there's uh, package updates that are outstanding. So if you do them, uh, then you're not going to get emails, but if you get an email about it, then you can log into the machine, do it, and, uh, and then the next day you're not going to get an email. If, you, if, you, if you're Slack and you're not doing it, then you'll get emails every day until you actually do the updates. The reason why I use both of those is that for some machines, I don't actually want to have unattended upgrades, like the Myth TV machine. Um, I don't want that to be automatically updated in case uh, something blows up in, in Myth TV and then later that loses a bunch of recordings. So I do those uh, manually, and I use Apticron for that. But for other machines, I just unattended upgrades. And if something blows up, then I'll deal with it later. Um, other things that are kind of useful in this sort of package updates um, area, uh, Deb Orphan and Deb Foster. This is basically about finding out the stuff that's no longer needed on your system. So packages that you may have installed as dependencies of other ones or um, things that you installed and you're no longer using. Um, so they will, they will help you find those packages. Uh, sometimes it's packages that, have, that, that are obsolete, that have been removed from Debian and therefore are no longer security supported, for example. Um, and you may not notice. Um, so it's kind of good to, to run these things, to clean up. You know, you can save some disk space, but that's not the main uh, point there. I think it's more about making sure that you don't have stuff that's not needed anymore or not supported. Um, along those lines, there's a new package. I think this got added maybe in Squeeze LTS or Wheezy. I'm not too sure. Um, this is really cool. Uh, what this does, um, when you install this, it will warn you if you have, I think it's at app get time, uh, if you have any packages that are out of support, out of security support for Debian, because normally Debian supports everything for security, but with Squeeze LTS uh, now, we have um, basically a, a set of packages that are no longer supported. So, uh, the, because it's really hard to support like random PHP applications for five or seven years, right? Um, so, the, so the, this package will actually tell you if you have anything installed that's no longer supported. Um, so on, I, th I think on the Wheezy system or Jesse, it probably doesn't do much, um, un unless something, sometimes actually things are removed from stable as well uh, for, for various reasons. So that could potentially warn you about this. In terms of monitoring, um, 
I've got um, a couple of things that I do. Um, log check is kind of the main one that I use. Um, and this is basically um, a, a tool that you use to, um, so there's a lot of log files on a, on a typical Debian system, right? And it's really hard to, they're really noisy, it's really hard to find the stuff that really matters if you, if you look at all of your logs. So the natural thing to do is to just not look at the logs until you have a problem. Then you go into the logs and you can see, oh, that's probably what the problem was. Now, that's not a very proactive kind of way of, of, of using log files. So log check is slightly different. It allows you to find this sort of needle in a haystack. By um, it, it looks at all of the, of the important log files, and then it has rules of stuff to ignore. So basically, you ignore all the normal stuff all the normal noise that log files produce, and uh, you only get an email about the stuff that doesn't match any of those rules. So basically, unusual stuff, unexpected messages. Um, so this is what so log check is is used for stuff like that. Um, it's a little bit high maintenance because uh, when you set it up, you have a whole lot of stuff that you need, a whole lot of new rules that you need to add to ignore the stuff that you don't care about. Um, but once it's set up, it's really nice. Like you get. You only get an email from those machines that you support when something bad happens or something weird. Um, and that can tell you, for example, um, sometimes you have like uh, drive controller errors, um, like read errors from hard drives, things like that, um, or CPU errors, all, all kinds of weird hardware stuff that, that happens. Uh, you'll often see that in the logs. Um, yep. Sorry? Oh, that's feedback. Okay. Um, so smart run tools is, is really nice. Um, this is one that, uh, this is a package that uses um, the, something that's built into drive controllers. Um, so a lot of um, ATA hard drives and SCSI hard drives and stuff, um, in fact, I think all of them, come with this uh, thing called smart, which um, it watches, so it's on the drive controller itself, and it watches a whole bunch of things that, uh, that tell you about the health of the hard drive. Um, it watches temperature, it watches the number of relocated sectors, when you have bad sectors and they get moved around on the drive, and um, a couple of other things like this. Um, really good thing to, to do, uh, to use, um, because then you get uh, advanced warning when something is likely to fail. Um, and uh, it can also run a, a self-test, so the drive will actually test itself, like look, reading every sort of sector of the drive, um, and that's an online test. You can do other stuff while this is happening, although it slows down your system quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and if that ever fails, like it takes about two hours to, to run this, so you can run it once. I've, I think I've, I've, that, I've got that set to run uh, once a week. And uh, if, that, if that actually fails, uh, that's a really bad sign. So, uh, so you might want to replace that drive. And, but because you have this, setup, uh, th this computer set up with RAID 1, then it doesn't matter that much. You can take the drive out, order a new one, and then you know, think again. Uh, MC log is slightly less useful um, because it doesn't, ha it doesn't catch as many things. But this is basically um, uh, about CPU errors. So normally what you would see in your logs is something like MC error, and that's it. Um, in your in in like syslog or something like that, or, or maybe it's a kernel log. I'm not sure. Um, and that and that stands for machine check exception. Uh, but it's not particularly useful because that's all it says in the logs. If you install MC log, then that actually queries the CPU to find out more information about uh, what it is that the CPU has encountered, what sort of error it has error it has encountered. Um, now that's not necessarily useful for you reading the error message but it might be useful to actually search for it and figure out whether you know, it might be a, a, a microcode error or whatever. Um, so it gives you a little bit more debugging output. LM sensors, um, that's, a, that's an interesting one. It will um, talk to all of the various sensors on your motherboard uh, and CPU. So you get like temperature readings, uh, RPM readings for fans. So for example, if you, if you have a fan that, that normally goes at, I don't know, 1200 RPMs, and all of a sudden it goes at like 50, that's probably dying and might be time to replace it. Um, if it's a CPU fan, you probably want to do that quickly because um, you're going to see other, you might see the temperature rising in other uh, things. Um, this is 
Unfortunately, that package only works if you have a supported motherboard. Like, it's, it's actually, the, I'm lucky because I have one of those motherboards that's supported so that it's pretty easy and nice. Um, otherwise, it's a lot of fiddling and you have to configure a bunch of stuff manually. Um, so if, if it's too much work, just, you know, I don't do it. But uh, when you can actually set it up, it's, it can be quite useful. Sysstat is another tool I use um, that's quite nice. So this is basically something you need to, uh, to install ahead of time. Um, and it will, every, I think it's every 10 minutes, yeah, every 10 minutes, it will take a snapshot of various things on, on, on your computer. So like how much uh, the swap file is used, how much memory is used, with the, the, the percentage of idleness in the CPU, that kind, those kinds of things. So if, you, if the person whose computer, whose computer you're supporting um, tells you, oh, my computer is a bit slow and, and you know, I don't know what's going on, um, sometimes if you, if, you, if you train that person to, um, like I did with my dad, I've trained him to, to always write down the time when something like that happens. So if he complains to me, like, oh, my computer is, is slow sometimes, that's not particularly actionable. Um, but if he tells me it was slow at that particular time, then I can look and insist that and sometimes I can see, oh, well, it was running out of memory and it was sw swapping like crazy. That's why. Um, so, you know, you can sort of debug things a little bit better if you have that installed and set to collect uh, this information every 10 minutes. Um, in terms of safety, there's a couple of packages that, are, that I found quite useful. Um, MoliGuard is, uh, is really interesting. Um, so MoliGuard is about uh, preventing accidental reboots of the wrong server. So, for example, you might be SSH'd into another computer, and then uh, you upgrade your own laptop, and it's time to reboot to take in the new kernel updates. And you type reboot, enter, and you realize that you're actually rebooting this other server that was recording you know, via MythDB or something like that. Um, what MollyGuide does is that it, when you type reboot, it prompts you for the name of the box that you want to reboot. So if you type it in the wrong SSH or in the wrong terminal, you type, in, type it in an SSH session or something like that, um, you're not going to make that. You, know, you actually have to type in the wrong host name as well to, to make that mistake. So it's pretty handy. Um, another one um, that's quite handy is a tool that I wrote called uh, SafeRM. Um, if you do something like this, you want to delete a file in user lib, and um, you accidentally do this, put a little stray space there, um, RM is going to do something somewhat undesirable and uh, proceed to delete all of your user lib. Um, so what SafeRM does um, instead, and you know, that's, that's what's going to happen, it's a very pleasant thing to, to recover from. Um, what SafeRM does instead is that it, it's basically a wrapper around the RM command, and it has a built-in blacklist which is configurable. Uh, and if, so these things, for example, are in the blacklist and uh, in the default one. And if it sees any of those paths that you're trying to delete, it will just ignore them. It will do this. So if you, and the, the, the idea here is that there are certain paths on my system that um, if I ever ask the, the RM command to delete, it's almost certainly a mistake. There's absolutely no reason that I can see for me to want to delete user lib normally. And so, uh, so this is what our SafeRM is there to prevent. Now, if you actually want to delete it, you can go and, uh, and use the slash bin slash rm command directly and do it. But it, it does prevent those sorts of accidental mistakes. Yes? It affects script as well. Like you, so you don't want to put stuff that, like, you want, you want to basically, in, in your blacklist, you want to put only stuff that should never be deleted for any reason. Um, like userlib, right? Like if you have a script that deletes userlib, it's probably a bad script. Right? There's like a, there's a IRC bot or something that deleted the flash user, I think. Uh, this is like a famous GitHub bug. Um, that would have prevented something like that. Um, un unless it actually uses the syscall. Then, you know, that, this wraps around the RM command. If you're not using the RM command, then you know, it doesn't do anything. Um, Etsy Keeper. Is, uh, is another one that's quite neat. So what this uh, does is that it keeps your slash Etsy in revision control. Now, I put this into the safety category because I think it's, it's quite useful. 
um, because you can, when, when uh, you slash at sees a git repo, you can easily tell um, that you've made changes to files that you didn't want to change. For example, you can just do a git status, you see what your changes are, do a git diff, and then, oh, I didn't actually mean to touch this file, and you can revert it easily. Um, also, what you can do is commit to, uh, to your repo after you made some changes, and that allows you to keep track of the changes that you're making. And uh, what I often do as well is I will use git log for a particular file to see, uh, for example, if, you, if you're trying out a new config for Apache or something like that, and then uh, it turns out it fails, you can do a git revert, or if you only realize much later on that you, know, you made a mistake three months ago, you can go back in the history for that file and then go back to the previous uh, config that you have. Um, so I quite like that. Um, and it works with Git, Bazaar, Mercurial, Darks, um, a lot of whatever version control system you want to use. Um, probably not CVS uh, or SVN, but who knows. Um, this is another one um, that's uh, quite useful for me because of that machine that runs MythTV. And this was written by Andrew here. Um, and uh, this, so basically what that does is that when you log into a machine, it shows you this, which, uh, which is, is this um, computer currently recording anything? And when is the next scheduled recording? So if you need to reboot for a kernel update or something like that, you can look at the scheduled recordings and see whether or not you have enough time to do the reboot or whether you should wait after that show is recorded. Um, and, but the other thing is if, if the computer is currently recording something, uh, it may not be such a great time for a disk upgrade, for example. So you might want to wait a little bit longer. Um, SL is a pretty uh, cool package, uh, another one to uh, prevent some accidental typos. Uh, you should install it. And that brings me to security. So my approach here in security is kind of in line with what I talked at the beginning of the talk um, in terms of not making this my full-time job, right? Because I'm doing this um, to help out friends and family. So I'm not going for the super secure kind of uh, approach. Um, there are lots of things that you can do to make a system much more secure. You can say, for example, have checksums that are stored on a different computer or have like a log server that will collect logs for everything. So that if, if an attacker comes in and deletes your VAR log, you still have something. Um, but that requires more effort, requires more uh, setup uh, than I'm necessarily willing to do. So I'm kind of going for um, a slightly, like a, re a reasonable approach. I'm trying to go for the, the sort of the quick security wins that I can get. The things that are, that are basically no effort, uh, but add a little bit, uh, add basically some obstacles to, uh, to any wannabe hackers uh, getting to your box. Um, that's, a, that's an easy one to install. You can install AppArmor and the default profiles that come with um, Debian. To, uh, so that will, that will protect some applications that have uh, profiles built in. So like, for example, if you have a service that runs and it happens to, to come with an AppArmor profile, then it will be restricted a little bit more. Um, but if, you, if you're running services that don't have profiles built in, then it basically does nothing. Uh, but this is, like, if you, if you just install these things, it will protect a few things with no effort whatsoever. So that's the kind of solution that, I, that I'm looking for there. Um, DebSums is, in, is interesting. What this one does is that it, um, it looks at, your in, uh, at all of the files that are installed by your packages, and it does a checksum of them. It compares that with the checksum that comes with the .deb that installed the package. So all of the, uh, the Debian packages come with a checksum built in to the dev. And um, if for some reason, after you've installed them, some of the files were modified, say you know, something in user bin or user sbin got modified, one of the binaries is different from what the package says it should be, um, that's probably something that you should look into. There are a few ex exceptions where, uh, that, you can white that you can whitelist where it's OK. Um, like the, uh, there's a package that installs PCI IDs and USB IDs, and there are tools to, to keep that up to date, um, like if you want to run that on cron or something like that, in which case you have to whitelist these files because they will be more up to date than what the package is expecting. Um, but normally, if you have things that have changed and you get a warning from DevSums, it's a bad sign. Um, 
could be a security thing, or it could also be just you know like a bad hard drive or something like that, and you know some bits have flipped. Um, So the comment was that it's, it's good to install this early because there are a few packages that don't, uh, I'm not sure why they, 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 it's like that, but there are a few packages that don't have checksums built in. Um, it's optional. Oh, so it must be something, it, it must be something that the, the dev helper does. So packages that don't, that don't use dev helper may or may not have checksums. And for those, uh, dev sums will actually uh, look at what you've got installed um, and, and create checksums for them. So it's good to install it early, um, as, as was suggested there, um, to make sure that you, that you set up this, this checksum database um, and that it can be checked all the time. Uh, and that comes with a cron job that, runs, that can optionally run daily to go through your file system and check everything. Um, there's another one that's related called fcheck. Um, this one looks at, uh, at the files directly. It's, it doesn't know anything about the packages, but they will look in user lib, it will look in user bin, sbin, directories like that, and it will warn you if something has changed. And so it, uh, it gets triggered. Um, so there, there is a hook for apt-get, so that whenever you update a, a package or you upgrade a package, uh, you will, uh, it will update its, its own checksums. But basically, it keeps its, its checksums in var lib, and uh, if anything uh, changes in one of those watch directories, then you'll get an email. So that covers stuff that's not necess necessarily packaged. If you have something uh, in user lib that didn't come from a package, then fcheck uh, will catch it. Uh, now, of course, as I said before, there are much better uh, solutions if you want to have uh, very good security. You should ideally keep those checksums on the different machines and, th and things like that, because if an attacker comes and changes your, uh, like, a binary, um, then, you know, they, they can just update the checksums, and they can change the checksum in the, in the dev as well. That would defeat both of these packages. Um, but that's a lot more work than I'm willing to put in, and these things will catch um, less sophisticated attackers. Oh, I should have pointed out that uh, I'm not trying to make my computers NSA-proof. Um, because that seems to be the big, uh, the big hip thing to do now. Um, check rootkit, check security, easy things to install that uh, probably don't do a whole lot, but check a few things. Um, RK Hunter is another one that looks for um, evidence of rootkits, so it knows about a few rootkits, and it will warn you if it detects these things. Um, that's a little bit like, uh, the, like AV programs on Windows. You know, it looks for a particular signature, and if it finds it, then it warns you about it. So not particularly um, exciting, but, you know, why not? Tiger is, uh, is I, I like that one a lot more. Um, Tiger actually checks for, uh, there is a guide, I'm not sure what it's called in Debian, of basically security best practices. Um, it's in this, this admin, so it's, it, it will tell you things like, for example, uh, if you, when you configure SSH, uh, don't enable uh, v1 of the protocol because it's insecure, so it should be v2 only. So a bunch of basically best practices like this uh, are in that guide, and Tiger is a thing that checks for them. So it will warn you if you have, uh, you know, anonymous FTP or uh, SSH v1, things like that, and then it will email you about it. Now, the neat thing is that it emails you once about every problem that it finds. So once, once when it finds a problem, and then once after it detects that you've actually resolved the problem. So if it warns you about a problem that you don't care about, you can just delete the email, and you'll never, never hear about it again. Uh, but that's, that's really useful uh, when you install it. Um, so you can, when you set up a new computer, you can install that, and that kind of double checks um, the stuff that you should have done when you set it up to make sure that you don't forget the little tweaks um, here and there that uh, in a lot of cases really should be default in Debian, I guess. But... Um, it's, uh, anyways, it's a good, good uh, configuration thing to, to have. Um, in terms of remote access, obviously I use um, SSH. And uh, there's another uh, tool for SSH called Mush, which is, uh, if you don't know about it, it's really neat. Um, it does um, basically, it, it, it runs over UDP instead of TCP, 
and it kind of, it kind of fakes uh, a really low latency SSH client by um, kind of showing you the keystrokes that you type as you type them as opposed to waiting for the server to echo them back to you. Um, and it all, because it's UDP based, you can also do really neat tricks like you, you are on the network and uh, you, SSH, you, you, you log into a box, you move to a different network, so you go from Wi-Fi to, to a mobile network, and uh, you can still keep going. You, you're not disconnected, even though your IP address changes, uh, because it's IP address agnostic. It's just like basically a TCP. You're just sending TCP packets, and you've got a little daemon on the server that listens for them. Uh, the neat thing about it is that to start using it, all you have to do is app get install mosh on the server, app get install mosh on the client, and that's it. Like, it uses SSH, the, your existing SSH uh, keys to bootstrap itself, and it's basically zero configuration. You can just start, you, you, instead of connecting to your server using SSH server name, you just use mosh server name, and you're done. Um, so really quite cool. Um, I've also got a blog post about a few little tweaks you can do to SSH to increase the amount of logging that you get and also restrict SSH a bit more than the default configuration. Um, I use IP tables as, uh, as a firewall. I know a lot of people uh, like UFW. Um, I never really got into UFW because my IP table files are actually quite simple. Um, that's basically you know, the sort of boilerplate that I've got uh, on all of my machines. And uh, I find it kind of useful to know what, what the underlying um, because UFW is basically a wrapper around IP tables, which is uh, the real is closer to sort of to the to the kernel stuff. And um, all I do really is 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 use that that sort of boilerplate there and enable ports for servers. You know, it's quite actually quite readable. Um, and in Debian, you can stick it into slash etc slash network slash IP tables that up the rules, and um, then that will be. Uh, picked up, and there's a really neat uh, tool called IP tables apply that will try, try a new firewall rule. It asks you whether or not you can still connect to the machine, and it's got a timeout of 30 seconds that will revert the, uh, the new rules if you, uh, if you don't say yes. So if you apply a new rule to the server that you connected over by SSH and it locks you out, then it doesn't matter because in 30 seconds the thing will be reverted. Uh, so it's quite neat. Um, I also use um, a piece of software called FWNUP, and this is um, actually pretty neat. It's a technique called single packet authentication. Um, it's derived from, uh, I guess, in the, the history of it is that it used to be about port knocking, which is this technique where um, your firewall is, it has closed off, say, the SSH port. But then, if you actually, if you, if you uh, use uh, a, particular, a particular client, and you try to connect to, say, port um, 1,000, and then you, you try port 1,200, and then 1,400. Then if you do this sequence of like trying to connect to th those three specific ports, then it detects that you've done this, the magic knocking sequence, and it will open up port 22 just for you for 30 seconds, or something like that, just for your IP address. So this is a way of basically closing all the ports but uh, allowing you to re-enable them using so this kind of magic sequence. FWNOP extends that idea further um, because there are a lot of limitations with port knocking. Uh, for example, if people configure it to be you know, port 1000, 1001, 1002, then you know, a port scan would actually open it up um, so, because it will just hit those, those, those ports sequentially. Um, FWNOP is really neat. You send one single packet to... Uh, to a port, I think it may even be any port, and it's, if you GPG encrypt um, the, the magic um, passphrase or something, the, the password that you've got set up, then uh, you can tell the firewall, because the firewall will see this packet, that uh, it will drop it, and then it will look at it and see, oh, this actually matches the magic password thing, and it will open up SSH for you for 30 seconds, just for your IP. So, um, so this is basically about hiding the fact that you're running SSH, and then once you use the thing, then it opens it, opens it up for you. You can log in, and then it closes it again. Um, so it's quite neat. Um, I also use um, DIN DNS, the service, for um, because I'm behind uh, most of the boxes that I maintain are behind um, dynamic IP addresses. 
And there's a neat little tool called IP Check in Debian, which is one of many to keep that automatically up to date. And I also use, uh, so, so this is not for servers, this is for the desktops that I support. I set up VNC um, because um, it's, when, when you're trying to describe a problem to someone over the phone or, or you're hearing someone's description of a problem, it's just so much easier if you can actually see what they see on the screen because very often, you know, they will, they will be describing something that, um, and, and just you know, not noticing that there's a little tiny thing that actually makes a huge difference. And then when you see it on your screen, it's like, oh yeah, it's because of that. And it, it could cut down the, 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 uh, the, the, the amount of time that you do tech support for immensely. Really, really useful. Um, I, I use, so the first one is, this, is the server component that I use. This um, starts up a VNC server with the running X client. So no, there's lots of ways to set up VNC. Uh, this one will basically, it's, it's like sharing the existing X session that a person has over the VNC protocol. So I can start that, log in as my dad in his box, start this up, and then I run the, the SSVNC as a client, not on my laptop, tunneled over SSH because um, VNC doesn't have very good, a very good authentication story. Um, and then I can basically take over his computer. He can see what I'm doing. I can move the mouse, et cetera. Um, I've got a blog post about the tweaks that I've done to, for the high latency link that I've got. Um, there's a few things you can do where it's actually quite good. Uh, could almost watch a video at a very low frame rate. Um, but yeah, it's like if, we, if you tweak it, it can, it can be quite good. Um, backups. So backups, of course, are important. Um, and, uh, and one thing with backups is that you don't have a backup until you've actually tested your backup. So always important to keep that in mind. I'm going to talk about backups, but really I should be talking about restores because you need to test it. Um, I split the, the stuff that I back up in three different categories. So all the data that's on my dad's computer is either um, config files, like the stuff that I set up myself, um, important documents, like I don't know, like, uh, like, like labor office documents, uh, banking statements or whatever that he wants to keep. Uh, and then um, the third category I call non-critical data. And I put in there stuff like uh, the Myth TV box will record TV shows. And, uh, and I put that in that category. So for the first category, the config files, um, I back that up using Duplicity, um, which is a really neat um, tool that... Um, We'll do incremental backups over SSH, encrypt them using GPG. Uh, so I just store all of that on my existing Linode because it's all GPG encrypted anyways. And um, I, so the reason why I back up config files is that if the machine were to crash, I don't want to have to reinstall everything from scratch because um, that takes a bit of time. And so I've got a backup of the latest config all the time. Uh, also, if I screw something up in the config, even though it's in slash etc, I should be okay, but, uh, but there's, there's another copy in there anyways. Um, so I put all of Sash etc. I put the list of installed packages. So if you have to reinstall a machine from scratch, the other thing you need to do is you have to remember to reinstall all the packages that were installed in the first place. Um, and thankfully, there's a neat dpackage command that you can run to actually output all of that to a file. And then you can just reapply that as, uh, as a single command and then reinstall everything. Um, so if, you, if you've got that, the list of packages, and all of the config files, you pretty much have the box into the same condition. You can, you can restore very quickly to the same state that you had. Uh, the other thing I back up is the MythDB database uh, dump, MySQL database dump. Uh, in terms of the important documents, there's a couple of things that I put in that category. Um, I created in, in his, inside his documents folder, I created a, like, a safe subdirectory, and I, I told my dad, if you put anything in there, then I will back it up. If you don't put it in there, it's not backed up. So if he's got something that is, uh, so I told him also, like, don't put like a 10 gig file in there, because uh, Duplicity doesn't really like GPG encrypting large files and then SCP them over. Um, but this is the, the, the way that he um, can um, basically ensure that certain things are backed up. I also do his emails and um, his bookmarks because bookmarks are just like a single HTML file in Firefox, so that's why not. 
um, back and on. It's really easy. Um, for the non-critical data, I've basically told my dad, like, that's up to you. I've shown, I've shown him how to like, burn DVDs and USB keys and stuff like that. But basically, I told him, like, just if, you, if, if I were to like, just reset your computer completely, um, what would you miss? So, you know, like music files, um, the, uh, the TV show recordings, that kind of stuff. So he backs it up himself. And um, so I've basically kind of put that out of scope for, uh, in terms of what I do for him. Um, so, and then the last section uh, uh, is about um, giving back. And um, that's kind of, uh, I guess, a, 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 in, in a sort of a broad way. Um, there's a couple of packages that can help Debian and other folks that, uh, that I install on all of the boxes that I run. Um, one of them is Popularity Contest. I think it's installed by default, but it's not set to send, submit data by default. Um, but what this does is that it submits the packages that are installed on your machine um, anonymously to Debian servers, and that gets used in the project for uh, various things. And the initial um, idea behind it was it would tell us which packages have to go onto the first CD, uh, because Debian used to come on CDs. Uh, it still does, but um, I don't know that the first CD is that useful anymore. Um, but that was the initial um, idea behind that, that uh, package. Now it's been used for a whole lot of other stuff um, to gauge sort of, uh, to, sort of basic metrics as to whether or not certain things are, are still in use in Debian or not. Um, so it's a good thing to, to install on your machines to make sure that you kind of vote for packages that you use. Uh, another one is called kernel oops. And so when your uh, kernel crashes, um, so let's call it an oops, um, it will send essentially like a backtrace, debugging information back to uh, kernel.org so that they can, uh, so this is a little bit like, you know, Windows just crashed. Would you like to send this report to Microsoft? Um, this is the equivalent for the Linux kernel. And uh, I think it might, it, it's probably useful sometimes to, to try and debug things, but also to get um, a, uh, an idea of what the worst offenders are in terms of kernel modules and things like that. And of course, that's usually NVIDIA, um, but um, they, it, sometimes it can be other things as well. Um, so yeah, so you just need to get installed those two, and then you're done. So that's basically what I do when I support other people's computers. Um, I've sort of you know, accumulated a list of, of favorite packages over the years, um, but I'd be quite happy to hear what, you know, if other people have uh, suggestions of things I should do keeping in mind that I, I want to stay uh, a, a amateur sysadmin. I don't want to have to, to I don't want to install something that will turn me into a full-time uh, sysadmin. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions or suggestions of other packages. And, yep. App, so this, uh, I'll repeat the question. So, the, so you, apt list bugs uh, was the suggestion. Um, I, uh, I, I use that on my own machine. So what app list bug does is that when you are going to app get upgrade uh, or app get install a package, if the package has release critical bugs, so very severe bugs, then uh, or maybe just an important, I'm not sure what the severity cutoff is, but it will warn you about it. So like you're about to upgrade to this new version of Apache, uh, but actually it doesn't start. Uh, would you like to do that or not? So you can abort the app get upgrade at that point. So quite useful. Um, it tends not to, um, in my experience, it's not so useful on stable. It's very useful on unstable, uh, if you write unstable. Yep. Something like that? Uh, when you talk about secure shell, why did you mention denial of the lockdown? So when I talked about uh, SSH, why did, did I not mention deny host um, stuff? Um, I. I don't particularly, I don't really use that um, on, on my machines. I, I, the blog post I linked to has a few other things that I do, um, but um, I've not really found that to be, I may, maybe I'm wrong, I've not really found that to be a, a super useful um, restriction. It's, quite, it's a little bit annoying to maintain as well. But, um, yeah. Yes? Um, I, I found that one of the pieces was Mm -hmm. I found that for the other machines that I have been more trouble with it with because the battery dies or it actually makes the and more than the rubbish um, I've set up for this chip, you know, um, to be open to being where box was and how it was and literally with some machines and covers a lot of machines and it's, you know, how it uses people compatible with that. But yeah, I just found that um, uh, introducing UPS to make things for a lot. 
So the comment. So the, the, there's two comments. The, the, the comment was basically UPSs sometimes make things worse because, for example, you have to replace a battery when it dies. So apparently sometimes it makes the power worse as well because the, the tolerance is too tight and it, it uses the battery too much and runs it down. Yeah. I've, that's, that's possible. I, I think I've only had to replace it once in about like eight years. So that's been working out okay for me. Uh, but yeah, it's good to know. Oh, yes, sorry. How do you, how do you test, the question is how do you test whether or not the UPS is working? Is that a question? Um, the, the best way to, to, to test it really is to, uh, is to pull the cord out uh, while it's running. Uh, then, uh, your dad yep. yeah, I've had my dad do that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically, um, the, similarly the best way to test whether or not your, uh, your RAID configuration is working is to take one of the drives out and do something with it and then, you know, See if you can see if you can actually boot from with only one drive, which you know if you forgot to install Grub on both of the drives, it won't. Um, and then you know like resync everything um, twice. So yeah, best way to test uh, a UPS thing I found was to just unplug the power and uh, see if it so it goes. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Still on the UPS, uh, Genesis Energy managed to fry two mainboards for me by fiddling with the smart meters and other stuff. So it is very recommended in certain parts of New Zealand. And it's okay. worthwhile the effort and updating the battery on occasion. Did, did you have a comment as well? Or? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, it's There is various packages which will do automatic UPS testing if you have USB or serial connections and then send you emails about failed test reports. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yep. Yeah. Um, So the question was, have I tried to support other uh, architectures, like non-Intel architectures? Uh, the answer is no. Like all, the, all of my friends and family have very standard um, like AMD or Intel boxes. Right. Now it's just I'm, I'm looking for perhaps supporting something for a family member who manages to block fans and fry motherboards and stuff like that. And I was thinking of getting something like a QB truck, which has no fan and can't be blocked. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And it runs Debian fine. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Francois.